Our Heavenly Father, our hearts echo that prayer that we just sang. We pray that you would grant your Holy Spirit in greater measure and in greater power to us, Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to open our hearts so that we can be saved. We need the Holy Spirit to come and strengthen us to resist sin. We need the Holy Spirit to give us a love for you, Jesus. We, we can go through the motions of worship, but only the Holy Spirit can put the fire of love for Christ in our souls. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit in order to uh, kill sin in our lives. We need your Holy Spirit to change us and to make the fruit of the Spirit grow and the works of the flesh wither. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit because uh, we need unity in our church. Lord, we need love in our church, and love is just really hard to do. And so we need you to, to continue to generate unity within us through your Spirit and to help us love each other. Lord, we need your Spirit so that we would have courage and effectiveness to tell others about Jesus. We need your Spirit in so many ways. And so, Lord, forgive us for things that we've done this week to quench the Spirit. Forgive us for things we've done and said and thought that have grieved the Spirit. Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us and just bring us back to where we need to be this week. Lord, I pray for this congregation that you would fill this congregation with unity, with love, with uh, hearts that, that care about their neighbors, hearts that care about the people around them. God, give us a great vision for uh, those around us in need. Help us to love them. Help us to bring the gospel to them. God, I pray that you would um, bless the, the work of this church. We pray for your blessing on the upcoming Vacation Bible School. We pray for your blessing on the business meeting on Tuesday night, Lord. May your spirit just strengthen the church as we do the work of ministry together. Father, I, I do pray for members and of our church family who are grieving this morning. We pray, Lord, for the Bailey family and the loss of their patriarch. God, we pray for Audrey Rubin and uh, loss of uh, her mom and Marilyn Sage as well. Lord, bless those who grieve. Bless those who are hurting and struggling. Lord, I pray for those who are here in this crowd, this happy throng who inside are not so happy. And I pray, Lord, that they would seek you today and find comfort and find truth in you. And Lord, I do pray for other churches on the South Shore that are gathering today. Lord, I lift up First Baptist uh, Church in Abington. Lord, bless that congregation. And we pray for Beechwood Congregational Church in Cohasset. Thank you, Lord, for Matt and Grace Dorn and uh, our support of them over the years. And thanks that Matt is serving as the interim there, Lord. And we just pray your blessing on the congregation, that it would thrive. Because Cohasset needs the gospel really bad. Just like Hingham, just like Norwell and Weymouth. Oh, Lord, may your gospel come to our towns and use us as your vehicles. And now, Lord, as we open up your word, we just pray, speak to us, speak through your spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures. And so, Lord, give us your spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you open up your Bibles to the book of Joel chapter 3? Joel chapter 3, it's on page 903 if you're using a pew Bible. Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, if you're using a pew Bible, page 903. So I guess about a week and a half ago, we had a, we had a close call. There was an asteroid the size of the Golden Gate Bridge that was so big it had its own moon that passed within 3.6 million miles of the earth, which sounds like a long way, but apparently in uh, astronomical terms, that's what they call a near miss. Uh, and then I just read that last night there was an asteroid the size of uh, a truck that passed within 90, I think, no, 65,000 miles of the earth. And, you know, uh, of course, people start wondering, like, well, what would happen if an asteroid like that hit our planet? And, you know, you can get apocalyptic really fast, imagining, you know, a huge rock slamming into the earth. And, like, would that extinct life on earth? Is that how the dinosaurs died? You know, what would happen if something like that happened? And, you know, it just makes you wonder, like, how will the world end? Will it be something like that? I, I feel like those kinds of incidents just make, at least my imagination, go to those kind of crazy questions. Uh, we know the world has to end at some point. I mean, it can't just go on forever. You know, at some point, the, the sun will run out of hydrogen and will turn into a red giant and, you know, expand, and then that'll be bad for us. Um, 
But, but is that how it's going to end? You know, will, will the world end because it's on a collision course with some monstrous asteroid, you know, like in the movie Armageddon or Deep Impact? You know, will it be like that? Or, or will the world end because of some solar flare that will shoot out and, and irradiate life on our planet, uh, like in the movie 2012 or Knowing? You know, Hollywood loves to take these disaster themes and make them into movies. Or maybe there'll be a virus outbreak. This is cheery, isn't it? Or maybe... Uh, <laughs> Maybe there'll be, uh, I, I don't know, uh, maybe there will be an alien invasion. I mean, there's been a lot of movies about that, so I suppose it's a possibility. M- maybe that's how the world will end is, is, you know, some kind of extraterrestrial attack on our planet. Um, how will the world end? Well, as we look in the pages of the Bible, the Bible really gives us a picture of the end of the world, and it's a fairly consistent picture. Sometimes it's a confusing hard to interpret picture, but it's, there's some consistent themes of what the Bible says about how the world will end. And it matters how the world ends because it affects how we live today. Uh, and, and what the, you see in the Bible is that the end of the world is not some kind of random natural accident, not some collision between an asteroid and the earth, whoops, you know, kind of a thing, but that the end of the world is a very intentional, uh, very personal event, because it's an event in which the person of our Creator, God Himself, comes into a direct confrontation with the people of earth. The the, the end of the world will come not because earth is on a collision course with a big asteroid, but because earth is on a collision course with a great God. That's the end of the world. And it's talked about in many places in the Bible, and sometimes it's called the day of the Lord. That's one of the titles that's given to the end of the world in the Bible, the day of the Lord. And we've encountered it here in Joel. We've been studying Joel for the last couple Sundays. If it's your first time here, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've been studying Joel. And uh, here we are finally in chapter 3. And we've been getting little glimpses of the day of the Lord, this, the end of the world, how it will all finish. Uh, we saw one of those in last Sunday in chapter 2, verses 29 and 30. Uh, rather, 30 and 31, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There's a a great dreadful end coming. But then in chapter 3, what happens is it's like we we zoom in on that day. So so we've been getting hints about it throughout the book of Joel, but in chapter 3, We zoom in on that day and we get a close-up, startling picture of what that day will be like. And uh, on that day, what we find is it will be a day of great, unspeakably terrible judgment, but it will also be a day of wonderful, unspeakably glorious salvation. That it will be the day of extremes, the most extreme judgment, but also the most wonderful hope. The worst thing you could ever fear will happen on that day, and the greatest thing you could ever hope for will happen on the same day, on the day of the Lord. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read all of Joel 3, uh, all 21 verses, and I want you to kind of put on your good news, bad news filter. And say, what in this, where in this text, where, where do you see the, the bad news of judgment? And where in this text do you see the good news of salvation? And see if you can hear those themes and how, how that divides this chapter. So let me just read it and then we'll talk about it. In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine and that they might drink. Now what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon and all you regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I've done? If you're repaying me back, I will swiftly and speedily return on your heads what you have done. For you took my silver and my gold and carried off my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks that you might send them far from their homeland. 
See, I'm going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them. I'll return them, return on your own heads what you've done. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabians, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem and the earth and the sky will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for His people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. And then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem will, through all generations. Their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. Did you hear bad news? Really bad news? And good news? Really, really good news? The bad news is in verses 1 to 16, and it's a picture of the, the judgment that God will bring at the end of the world on the day of the Lord. So let's look at that half first, and then we'll end by looking at 17 to 21, which is the good news, the salvation. Um, and, and the first thing I want to just point out about uh, what happens on the day of the Lord, the, the, the judgment that takes place, is to look at the location. There's a location that this is going to happen. Do you guys see it in verse 2? I will gather the nations and I'll bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And then again in verse 12, let the nations be roused, let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Why are we going to the valley of Jehoshaphat? What is the valley of Jehoshaphat? Where is that located? What, you know, it, 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 no one really knows because I don't know if, if that's the point. In other words, the point is not to find the GPS location of this valley, that that's where the world's going to end. The key is the name. What does Jehoshaphat mean? And if anyone hears, you know, Hebrew or speaks Hebrew, it's, it's a Hebrew name, and it's a compound name. It's the personal name of God from the Old Testament, Yahweh, Yahu, Jehoshu is how we'd say it in English. And then it's the verb, Shaphat, which means to judge. So the name of the valley is Yahweh judges, or Yahweh has judged. So the point of the valley of Jehoshaphat isn't where it is, but the point is it's the place where God gathers all the nations together for judgment. That's why it says in verse 12, uh, let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Notice what this valley is also called in verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, when it's talking about the valley of decision, it's not talking about our decision. It's not like talking about that's the place where we all go to finally decide for Jesus. This isn't like the end times altar call. We're like, this is the day you need to decide for Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed. You know, it's not like that where, where it's some kind of decision moment for us. It's the valley where God is making a decision. In other words, maybe a better way to translate this would be it's the valley of the verdict. It's the valley of judgment where God renders a decision about the world and, and what should happen to the peoples of the earth. And so we see that the, at the end, that there's a, a time of great judgment when God will come down and render a verdict upon the nations and 
upon the world. And, and what's that going to look like? Well, let's, let's kind of zoom in closer now to verses 1 to 16. And there's two. You could take verses 1 to 16 and divide it into two sections. The first is verses 1 to 8, which is all about retribution that's going to happen on that day, where God is going to pay back the nations for the terrible ways they've treated his people. Verse 1, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of Yahweh judges. And there I'll enter into judgment against them concerning my people of Israel. Why? For they scattered my people among the nations. They divided up my land. What else did they do? They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes and sold girls for wine and drink. What else did they do? Verse 5. You took my silver and my gold and carried off my finest treasures to your temples. What else did they do? Verse 6, you sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks that you may send them far from their homeland. So the day of, of the Lord is a day when God rights all the wrongs that have been done to his people. You know, back in Israel's time, what had happened was the foreign nations had invaded Israel, God's people, God's land, and they had sent people into exile. They destroyed the temple of God. They took God's treasures away. And now God's saying, I'm going to pay you back for that. I'm going to set that right. And down through history, God's people have always experienced resistance and hostility and ill treatment from the world. I mean, it was true in the Old Testament with Israel. When Jesus came, Jesus is... Jesus is Israel. He's the fulfillment of Israel himself. And how was he treated by the nations? He was resisted, mocked, harassed, crucified, beaten. Jesus Christ was rejected by the world. And now we're his people, Christians. And and down through the centuries, Christians have experienced this same thing. Uh, From the New Testament times until this very day, Christians are imprisoned and rejected and, and teased, and you know, whether it's kind of teasing and alienation that you might experience in this culture, or whether it's brothers and sisters in other cultures around the world who are imprisoned today, who are harassed today by the law, some who are still giving their life for their faith today. And so God is keeping track of that. God is not losing track of that, and he's going to right that whole thing someday. Because you know, it's hard being a Christian, because we're told to turn the other cheek. That's what Jesus taught us. You know, Christians are forbidden. Christians are forbidden from using force to defend themselves when they're being persecuted for the faith. Right? There is no Christian version of jihad. When we're attacked for our faith, we, we, Jesus told us, take up your cross. He said, when you're persecuted, rejoice. Not resist, just Rejoice. And praise God that you're suffering for Christ. And so for us as Christians, it's really hard because in some ways, because if if we're getting pushback and resistance for our faith, you know, our our job isn't to to arm ourselves and fight for our rights. It's to just kind of suffer for Christ. And that's hard because then you go like, well, that just makes us doormats. Is that just how it's going to be? Is there never anything ever going to be set right? Yes, it's going to be set right on the day of the Lord. That's when it happens, not now. We, we have to wait for that day. God is going to rectify things. And, and so he's, he's telling the, his enemies here that everything they've done to harm his people will be paid back in full on the day of the Lord. It reminds me of the book of Revelation. Put a bookmark here. Go to Revelation If Joel's confusing, well, let's go to a clear book like Revelation (laughs) and just make it all simple. Look at Revelation chapter 6. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. This is one of the many strange visions of John, wonderful, strange visions. He says in Revelation 6, 9, when he opened the fifth seal... So he's having these visions, and the seal is opened, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. So John sees the martyrs in heaven, and they called out in a loud voice, 
How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the earth, the inhabitants of the earth, and avenge our blood? When when are you going to set this right? We're your people, God. And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. You got to wait, because there's actually more of you who are going to die. But it's going to get set straight. Just wait. And then what happens? Verse 12, this next seal is opened, and it's the day of the Lord. So the answer to their prayer, how long, is wait, but the day of the Lord is coming. Verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and then look, day of the Lord language. There was great earthquake, the sun turned black like sackcloth, made of goat hair, the whole moon turned to blood, the stars fell to the earth, the whole universe is falling apart. It's the end of the world. And Verse 15, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, every slave and free, hidden caves and among the rocks of the mountains, and they called to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Isn't that a funny phrase? The wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The day of the Lord is the day when all will be set right. And so it calls for for, for patience, for Christians in the midst of suffering, it calls for us to, to be patient. And, you know, it frees us from having to defend ourselves and fight for ourselves. You know, in terms of defending our faith, we, we don't have to, to be aggressive and fight for it. We, we just have to be faithful and, and be true. And, and if we're mistreated for it, you know, were you surprised? <laughs> this is what happened to our Lord. And we're just called to walk faithfully and to love and to trust that God is going to, to set everything straight someday. You know, again, the only jihad we are called to as Christians is against our own sin. That's the only holy war that we're called to as Christians. And we trust and wait for the day when God will take care of all the vengeance and all the retribution. And we are freed to simply love and to proclaim the gospel and to be faithful. But now go back to Joel 3. There's another half to that vision. What will the day of the Lord be like? It'll be a terrible day of judgment, not only... There'll be retribution, but there's something else that's going to happen. And now I'm looking at Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 16. There's also something else that happens in that judgment, and that is the ruin of the nations. So retribution against the nations, and also the ruin of the nations, where God judges the nations and, and ruins them forever. And it starts by God calling the nations out to fight. He calls them out to war. To, to come. It's sort of like God's egging them on. Come on, come on. Let's go. Let's fight. You know, verse 9, pro- proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near to attack. Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I'm strong. I can fight. You know, everyone, come on, come on. Let's fight. You know, God's calling them out. I, I don't know. I, I don't think this happens anymore, but when I was like in junior high and high school, if someone wanted to fight you, they would call you out. Did, isn't, do you guys, is that how they, maybe that's just a Western phrase, but that's how it was. I mean, you know, but you'd be in school and there'd be some kid who didn't like you and you'd feel a tap on your shoulder at your locker and you'd turn around and he'd say, I call you out today at the playground after school, you know, <laughs> and the kids would go out there, you know, or the teacher would find out about it and that'd be the news. Did you hear Jimmy called Fred out, you know, and, uh, and I asked my kids, I'm like, do kids get in fist fights in school anymore? They're like, no, we just do cyberbullying. I was like, Wow. <laughs> Get inside your head. Like, I think I prefer the fist fight because, you know, it's over. Though I suppose as a pastor, I should prefer neither. Um, but <laughs> anyway, here's God calling the nations out. God's like, come on, proclaim the war. Beat your swords into plowshares. Come on, let's fight. And so the nations are roused for a big battle. And, 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 and they all gather together. And this is interestingly one of the themes you see about the end of the world in the Bible is that it appears that at the end of the world, there's some huge gathering for a war. It ends with a big battle. You know, you, you look like in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and we're not going to go there, but if you read that, it, it's this description of this final assault against the people of God, and there's this guy named Gog, G-O-G, not G-O-D, G-O-G, Gog, and he's some prince who leads all of these terrible forces against God's people uh, or you go on, and again, the book of Revelation, you have the battle of Armageddon. 
But, but there seems, it, you know, you've seen this picture in the Bible that there seems to be a final last stand when, when Satan gets one last hurrah and he leads some desperate last-ditch gamble assault against God and against God's people. It's, it's sort of like Satan's story ends with him starting with a rebellion against God, and it ends with a big rebellion where he marshals the whole world together. And, you know, it, it, who knows how that's going to play out. We don't know. But that, that seems to be the theme. And here it is again. On the final day, there's this big battle that takes place. That's why C.S. Lewis entitled uh, the, the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Septilogy, is called what? The Last Battle. And, and he's picking up on that biblical theme that it sort of ends with a war. Except here's the thing. When the war happens, it's going to be a total dud. All the nations are going to be charged up for war, and they're going to get there, and then it's going to be like, wah, 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 God wins. Boop, and that's it. It's not going to be epic. It's not going to be exciting. It, it's, it's almost like a trick, like God's baiting them in. Like, come on, I'll fight you, I'll fight you. And then they get in, and, and they're like, all right, we're ready to fight. We're in the boxing ring. No, you're actually not in the boxing ring. You're in the valley of judgment. Trick you. Time for judgment. And, and so you don't see a, a battle. You just see God coming down and pfft, squashing the nations, just judging them right there. Uh, look at verse 13. Verse 13 when you really just stop and read it, you know, I kind of read over it fast, but we're going to look at it. Verse 13 is chilling. Verse 13 can make your knees shake if you really think about it. Swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes for the wine press is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. The last battle isn't going to be a battle at all. It's just going to be a harvest. It's, it's like the wheat is marching against the farmer. Oh, no. Sickle. You know. And he's just swinging his sickle, and the wheat is falling. Or it's like a, a, a grape stomping. Do you see that? Do you get the imagery there? The valley of, of, of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat, suddenly turns out to be a big wine vat where the nations are stomped by God. They, they're, they're fixing for a fight, and they're ready to, to war with God, and God comes down and says, well, guess what? You're in a wine vat. And God stomps the nations. It's, it's a very violent, uh, devastating, terrifying picture of the world being crushed underfoot by the Lord. And I know we struggle with this. We, we struggle with the idea of a God of judgment uh, I, just last week, I was at a, a baseball game uh, for, for my son, and I was on the sidelines talking to a lady, and uh, so, so we got on, f- for a certain reason, we started talking about the Bible and things, and, and she's trying to read the Bible, and she said, you know, I really struggle with the Old Testament. I don't like the Old Testament because God seems so angry and mean and wrathful, and I want to stick with the New Testament where God seems nicer, and I can understand he's a God of love, but in the Old Testament, he just seems so, so furious and so strong, and and, and, you know, and we struggle with that, like a God who would trample the nations down. Uh, it's hard for us to understand, but I, I think part of the key is, is that last line in verse 13, so great is their wickedness. You know, the, the reason judgment is coming is because on the one hand, God is so good and he hates evil, and number two, because there is so much sin and wickedness in the world. You know, the world has so much good in it. God made the world good. God made the world, and he said, it is good. And then he made human beings in his image. So there is good in the world. There is, the people are made in the image of God. You see that in creation, and yet that same goodness and that same being made in the image of God has been just like corrupted and ruined by sin. You know, it's like, it's like when our basement flooded uh, a couple, like a year ago, and, and the, you know, the water got into the carpet, and it's a wonderful basement, but the carpet's ruined, and now it's moldy, and now you've got to rip everything out, and you have to rip out the whole basement, you know, <laughs> because of that, even though it's a nice basement, that, that water has ruined it and molded it and corrupted it, and sin has done that. And God hates sin, and so there's a great judgment that's coming. You know, there's so much wickedness in the world. The world is filled with lying. The world is filled with gossip and slander and people saying terrible things about each other. The world is full of people mistreating each other and abusing each other. 
I mean, this whole thing about selling people for food and drink and slavery, that, that's going on strong today. You know, it's human trafficking going on strong. Uh, the, the world is still immoral. They're still hooking up and <laughs> affairs and cheating and pornography. The world is still corrupt. Governments are still abusing their people, and people are still revolting to overthrow the governments only to put in other oppressive governments. And the cycle just goes on and on. The world is full of wickedness, and there's good in the world, but it, it is ruined. It's been ruined like a moldy carpet in a basement. It's got to be ripped out and replaced completely. Do you know what the number one cause of death in America is? Do you know why the number one reason human beings die in America? It's actually not heart disease. That's number two. The number one cause of death in America is infanticide. The number one cause of death in the world is infanticide. It's just a fact. More than war, more than malaria. And I'm not singling out abortion as the only sin. There's lots of sin. I'm just trying to look at the scope, look at the scale of the wickedness in the world. And when that judgment day comes and God finally calls the world to account on that day, and we see all the evidence laid out, the question we will be asking is not, how could God do this? The question we'll be asking is, how did He restrain Himself from doing it for so long? That will be the question. We say, oh, I don't know, it's, it's so tough. Get, get me to the New Testament. Get me to the New Testament. <laughs> oh, the Old Testament's so hard. Okay, let's go to the New Testament. Go to Revelation chapter 14. <laughs> Here's a picture of the return of Christ in Revelation 14, verse 14. Revelation 14. Verse 14, the return of Christ described using language directly from Joel 3.13. Quoting Joel 3.13, applying it to Jesus as the sickle swinger and grape stomper. Verse 14, I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown on his, of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. There's Jesus, the son of man. And then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so he's seated on the cloud, swung the sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. And then verse 17, another angel came out of the temple and he too had a sharp sickle and still another angel who had charge of the fire came out and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth vines because the grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the winepress outside the city. And then here's the graphic imagery of the blood flowing, just like the grape juice would flow. I mean, it's a terrible image. But this is the Lord Jesus, who is the great judge, who will judge all the nations. God is holy, and God hates sin, and we have a big problem the world, you know, oh, that the world were just going to end with an asteroid. Oh, that the world were just going to end with a solar flare. But we're going to face our maker, and he's going to hold us to account. And so what do we do in light of this? Going back to Joel 3. I mean, this is just terrible news. It, it, it's an end of the world that is beyond anything you've ever feared. It, it's like if we could get our heads around it, it would be scarier than anything that's ever scared us. This is scarier than anything you could even worry about and staying late up, up late all night. This is terrifying to have to face God's judgment. But remember last Sunday, verse 32? Chapter 2, verse 32? Here's the hope. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be what? Deliverance. Ah, so you can be delivered from the day of the Lord. That's right. You've got to get out of the valley and you've got to get up on the mountain. You've got to get out of the valley and get up on Mount Zion. 
The valley is the place of judgment, but Mount Zion is the place of salvation. And how do you get up there? You call on the name of the Lord. And so this is an, a, a, a dire warning. You know, it, it, it's like NASA sending out a, a, a word to the whole world that a huge meteor is coming. You know, get ready. Go into a bomb shelter. And this is like God saying, my judgment is coming, but even now he's telling us that we can still call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And so I just, I just plead with you again, if you've never called on the name of Christ, to call upon Jesus and be saved. Isn't it so great to know that salvation is by faith alone? This was the, the talk about a meteor. This was the meteor that hit during the Protestant Reformation that has been the best news. Salvation is by faith in Christ, not by works. We're not saved. We don't get up on the mountain by trying to fix ourselves because that's really discouraging. Every time I try to fix myself, I, I fix something, but I just find 10 new problems. You know? We're saved by faith alone, not faith plus works or faith plus religion. It's just faith, faith in Christ, calling on the name of the Lord and getting yourself together. No, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we need to just trust in Christ and call upon Him and put our faith in Him to be saved. That's how you're saved from this coming judgment because only Christ died and rose again. Only Jesus offers a way out. Let's talk a little bit about that mountain. We need to get out of the valley here. Let's get up on the mountain. Look at verse 17. Then you will know, I'm on chapter 3, verse 17. Then you will know that I, the Lord, dwell in Zion on my holy hill, and Jerusalem will be holy. That's where salvation is. There's always a contrast between the valley and the mountain. There's always a contrast between judgment and salvation. And it's interesting that when God judges, he also saves. And when God saves, he's also judging. So it's like judgment and salvation are two sides of the same coin. And whenever you see them in the Bible, they're always, they're always together. And the greater the judgment, the greater the salvation that you see. So in, for instance, the flood waters cover the earth, a great judgment. And Noah whoop, is in the ark. Great salvation. You know, or Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed for their wickedness as the fire falls from heaven. A great judgment, but a great salvation. God sends an angel to literally grab Lot and his family by the arm and, you know, get them out. I mean, that's a great salvation to have an angel actually come and haul you out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, uh, Egypt is judged by the plagues. Locusts and frogs and darkness and hail. But the Israelites in the land of Goshen are unaffected. The armies of Pharaoh are drowned in the Red Sea. But the people of God walk across on dry ground. Or how about one more? Jesus Christ is judged on the cross. And the darkness comes and the earth shakes and the day of the Lord comes as a terrible judgment falls upon Jesus. And yet the cross is also the moment of our great salvation through faith. And now we can be, what a great salvation. I just have to trust in Jesus? That's it? Wow. That's such a gracious salvation. I'm so glad it's just trusting in Christ. I know if I had to add something to that to be saved, I, it would be bad. Because I know my track record. I deserve to be in the valley of Jehoshaphat. But to think that Christ died for me and that I just have to, by faith alone, trust him to be justified. It's amazing. And so this is the great salvation. And, and this, I love how Joel ends with it in verses 17 to 21. It's, it's so good. Just look at it. Contrast it with the valley. Contrast the mountain with the valley. Up on the mountain, total protection. Total protection. Verse 17. Jerusalem will be holy, and never again will foreigners invade her. Verse 16, the Lord will be a refuge for His people, a stronghold for His people, Israel. It, it'll be total protection. Down in the valley, no protection. Total exposure. You're naked. Up on the mountain, total protection. God watches over. God saves and protects. Ah, oh, to finally be safe no fear of persecution, hostility, no fear of, of accidents, no fear of enemies, no fear of, of uh, 
governments or peoples, everyone here who's, who has anxiety disorders, you won't be afraid anymore. You'll be safe, forever safe. Everybody who's stressed out and worried, you'll be safe. We'll be on Mount Zion. We don't have to worry about something going wrong there. It's final, complete, total protection in the presence of God. And most importantly, we'll be safe from God because we're with God. We won't have to worry about judgment. I won't have to be worried about, oh, I'm going to screw this up. God's going to forgive me, and I'll finally be delivered to a place beyond sin where I'll no longer be wrestling with sin. I'll be safe from judgment as well. Total protection. Also total provision. Verse 18. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk and the ravines of Judah will run with water and a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and water the valley of the acacias. Total provision, not lacking anything. You know, down in the valley, there's overflowing, but it's the vat and that's terrible, it's gross. Up on the mountain and in God's land, total provision as the mountains run with wine. You won't have to worry about where the next check is coming from. You're not going to have to worry about what you're going to do to take care of your family. You don't have to worry about jobs and all the things we worry about to provide for ourselves and to provide for our lives. God is just going to pour that out. You know, to be under the blessing of God is going to be like standing at the, the, the Bordeaux wine waterfalls. You know, it's just, it'll be so much blessing just pouring out from God upon us. The last thing we will ever experience on Mount Zion is need or lack. It's a great place. But of course, most of all, oh, actually, one more. There's, there's population there. There's people. Verse 20, Judah will be inhabited forever in Jerusalem throughout all generations. There's a population. Isn't that great? You know, I, I love, again, just to share my heart here, I love us all being together in one service. And I think part of it is it's a little foretaste of what heaven is like. Heaven is one service. It is. It's the eschatological congregation. It, it's the end times church where all of God's people throughout all the centuries will finally be in one place forever, gathered together, no longer separated, no one going their different ways, all together. You say, wow, that's a lot of people to get to know. Well, we're going to have time. <laughs> it's going to be great. But most importantly, it's not only the place of protection and provision and population, it's also, most importantly, the place of the presence of God. Look at verse 17. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Verse 21, the Lord dwells in Zion. God dwells there. I'll tell you, what makes heaven so heavenly is that God is there. If you went to heaven and God wasn't there, it would not be heaven. That's what makes heaven heavenly, is the presence of the Lord. One more trip to Revelation, chapter 21. I love chapter 21 because I think I get it. Revelation 21. Verse 1, And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Yeah, it's the end of the world, but it's the start of the new. I saw the holy city. There's Zion again. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and He will live with them. They will be His people and He their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying and pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. 
That's how the world ends and that's how it begins again. But a different world, one without the ravages of sin, one where there'll never need to be another judgment, one where we will dwell with God. And so I just want to encourage you, keep going for Christ, you know, keep persevering. I I don't know what it is that you're enduring for the sake of Christ, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. In fact, whatever you think you're doing for Christ and the sacrifices we're making, like when we finally get there, we'll laugh that we considered them sacrifices. We'll laugh that we considered it suffering compared to, in comparison to, the glory that we'll have with Christ. You know, you, you junior high and high school students who are trying to live differently in your schools, and, and it's so weird. You know, everyone else is partying. Everyone else is hooking up. Everyone else is doing this and that, and, and you guys are trying to, to stay faithful, and it's weird. You, you, you don't fit in. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Every sacrifice you're making is worth it. Every sacrifice you're making for the Lord as a teenager is worth it. And those of you who get static from family and friends because of your faith, and they're like, why would you spend a nice Sunday morning in a church? Like, look, just take it. Just take the the static you're getting. It's totally worth it. And those of you who are, who are struggling through maybe difficult relationships or a difficult marriage, but you're trying to hold on to that marriage because you're trying to honor God and do His will, it's worth it. It's worth it if you're doing it for His glory because it's all going to matter and it's all going to work out. And those who, who have gone into ministry or gone to the mission field or uh, gone to be pastors or, or served as elders in churches or deacons. And, you know, it, it's like, yeah, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to go into ministry. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Oh, I, I didn't know I was going to be this hurt by ministry. I didn't know it was going to take this toll on my soul and on my life and my family. It's all worth it. It's all worth it. Whatever we think we've done for God or whatever we've given for God or sacrificed to stand for Him in this world is so worth it. It is worth it to avoid the valley of Jehoshaphat. I hope you see that. And it is worth it to gain the new creation because something is coming from heaven that is, it's so precious. It's so glorious and sweet that the Bible can't even describe it very well. It's just little images that we're trying to get. And so hold on and press on because the way the world ends matters profoundly for how we live today. It's everything. It's everything. Keep it in view and let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we do thank you that you have been so kind to us to show us what's coming. And Lord, even though some of it is hard to interpret and Bible verses seem strange, we get the picture. We get the big picture. You're coming back. You're going to judge. And you're also going to save. And so, Lord, we pray that now we would call out to you and be saved, that we would be saved by faith, not by works, that we'd be saved by Christ alone, through faith alone, through grace alone. Lord, that we would simply call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And I pray, Lord, for those of us who are waiting for that day, but some of us here are tired, some of us here are weary, some of us here are doubting whether this is all worth it following you. Oh, God, I just pray, would you give them a clearer glimpse? I I pray that, that some folks here would just go home tonight and read Revelation 21 again and get that picture in our hearts deep that it is worth it all because of what's coming for us. And so, God, give us faith in your word. This takes faith. It takes faith. So we need more faith. Strengthen us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.